You're an awesome God. Father, as we get into your word right now, we ask that you would speak to us. Um, We ask we'd be encouraged by the truth of your word. We ask, Lord God, that you would speak to us loud and clear, that we would help us to get it, open our minds, our hearts, our spirit, our, our spirit, our wills, our emotions, everything, our will to act, our will to respond. Help us to hear you right now, Lord. We thank you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 to 16. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, Passover begins in two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. At that same time, the leading priests and elders were meeting at the residence of Caiaphas, the high priest, plotting how to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, replied, Why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She's poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests and asked, How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him thirty pieces of silver. silver. And from that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated. Today's message is going to be called God's Powerful and Precious Love for Us. Uh, We've been journeying through the book of Matthew, and we are continuing to do so. But like I said, we're going to fast forward 10 chapters from where we were, because Matthew has a lot to say about the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? And so we're we're, preparing for Easter. We're going to take a look at Matthew's description of that very important event and series of events. And then when we're finished, we'll go back and take up where we left off. But right now, our whole goal is we want to, during this month of March, we want to focus on what Matthew says about Easter. And we're calling this little mini-series from Matthew, we're calling it For Us. For Us. Because we're going to look at the different things that Jesus did for us. How we can be blessed by it. How we can learn from Him. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the occurrence that took place just a couple days before Christ's death that describes key aspects about God's love. We just read it, of course. I'll ask you, sometimes, you know, when you think about it, we can experience rejection, can't we? Even when we just, we're just minding our own business, maybe, or even when we're trying to be nice, we sometimes can get rejected, can't we? I came across a couple of stories from people who shared uh, over a website on the internet uh, just a couple examples where they, in their own life, experienced some rejection stories, seemingly when they were kind of minding their own business. One was a, a girl named Meg Oldham. She recounted a time when she was in class at school, and the class was reading Romeo and Juliet. The teacher asked the class if they had believed in love at first sight. And Meg continued, she said, A boy who told me he was in love with me in third grade raises his hand and said, No, I don't believe in love at first sight. Because I used to be in love with this girl here in third grade, but now she's kind of eh. <laughs> kind of sad. Ouch, all she was doing was sitting there. Sometimes love can hurt. Rejection can hurt when you're just minding your own business. Another person named Blair Hogan recounted uh, the following story. She said, I was at an international performing arts festival. I was trying to prove to my friends that it's easy to make friends from people from other countries. I started talking to this group of Canadians when I tried to sing O Canada to impress them. They all got up at once and sang when I started singing and left. A double ouch. 
It's kind of hard when you're trying to do the right thing, being kind and feel rejected. Have you ever tried to do the right thing and just got lambasted instead? Maybe you were thinking of someone who, and, and you wanted to do something thoughtful or kind to them and they just mistook your motives. Perhaps you were in the process of doing a nice gesture and someone just saw you in the midst of it and they questioned what you were doing. And no matter what you said, they still looked at you suspiciously. It can be unnerving and hurtful, can't it? Years ago, while I was serving in the first church where I was a senior pastor, a small little church, a friend of mine named Darren, one of my closest friends of all time, I had discipled him. And he and I uh, vi- had... It was a calling. We went and visited someone who had recently attended the church. Actually, it was one of friend, Darren's friends. And so we visited him afterwards. It was a girl, one of his old-time friends. And so we visited her, and, and we spent a little good time with her, you know, talking, and we were there for a while. And, and then I, I, I drove him back to his apartment, and uh, it, was getting, it was late by this point. Um, and, uh, and Darren did not live in a, in a good part of town. This is West L.A., so, you know. And, uh, in fact, the area where he lived particularly was known for gangs and drugs. And, uh, and there's a lot to be said, but I won't go beyond that. But it was not a safe area. But that didn't matter. We were doing God's work. Who cared? And I remember sitting in, in uh, my car, and Darren was in the passenger seat, and we were just talking. And while we were talking, a police patrol car drove by and then stopped right next to my window and motioned me to roll down the window, and I did. And he said, what are you doing here? Uh, and I just told him the truth. My pastor, so Darren is a part of our uh, church, and we just visit someone to visit the church, and we were just sitting, he lives here, and we were just sitting in front, you know, discussing, you know, the call we just had. It was his friend. And he looked at me suspiciously. Didn't want to believe me. And Darren looked at me, it's, it's true. It's, it's true. And he goes, okay. And so he kind of reluctantly motioned and drove off. Darren and I talked a little bit longer, and then all of a sudden he drove by again. It's like, you know, it's obvious he does not want me to be here. So we quickly at that point uh, closed in prayer, and, and Darren went into his home. It's hard to be doubted when you know you're doing the right thing, isn't it? And when you're just trying to do the loving thing, the kind thing. What do you do? How do you handle suspicion with love and grace? Does it make you reluctant to want to do a nice gesture the next time? Do you maybe question God? uh, Why he would even allow this when you you and the Lord know your heart was right? Does it make you want to back off from doing any kind or thoughtful things in the future? And if you're honestly, if you're being honest, do you wish God or do you in your mind think, wish that God or others would have your back better? How do you deal with that? Or do you? Have you? What do you do with those kinds of things? We talk about God being, through, well, through Jesus, having a tight relationship with him. Well, don't friends have each other's back? Does Jesus have your back? The answer is yes, right? What's the answer? Is the answer yes? yes. That's, you kind of believe it. <laughs> Is the answer yes? Yes. Yeah, that's better. We'll work on it. Or maybe you're not sure. Yes, of course he has your back. But there are times we can maybe be tempted to wonder why we're trying to do the right thing. Does it seem like we can get insulted from it? And these might be some of the thoughts or questions that might have been going through this woman's mind that we just read about. Um, Matthew doesn't describe, that doesn't say the name of that woman, but John does. The Apostle John recounts the same story, and it said, he says it was Mary, uh, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And interesting on, in this situation, it, it, was, it was Passion Week, just a few days before uh, Christ's fateful moment of being handed over uh, to the Romans uh, by the Jewish leaders and eventually being crucified. And at this moment, while Jesus was giving his final preparation warnings uh, uh, with his disciples, we also read that Jewish leaders were in another place, Caiaphas' own high priest, and plotting Jesus' death. 
quite a dichotomy. And Matthew is talking about that intentionally, this dichotomy that's going on. But let's talk about where Jesus is at at the moment. This place where Simon had been, been had leprosy, no doubt the implication was Jesus had healed him. And now he had Jesus over there. And he's at least in the same town as Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So maybe they went back to both homes that day. I very well could have done that, the case, actually. They live in a small village, Bethany. And so they're there. And at that moment, Mary does that incredible thing where she proceeds to anoint Jesus with a very special and expensive perfume. One commentator that I read speculates that Mary was doing this to honor Jesus as Messiah, which certainly was possible. We read in just in John chapter 11, both Mary and Martha had that faith of Jesus being the Messiah. So that certainly could have been true. But I think there was something even deeper than that. Regardless of the real, that reason, I think her deepest motivation was love. And we learn from this episode, the love doesn't always make sense from a practical point of view. However, from several ways, if you think about it, um, in this situation, we can find that love can be communicated in a way that shows that love is powerful and love is precious. Love is powerful and love is precious. We're going to be talking about that today. See, in this, in this story, these two descriptions of love, we're going to see how it's both powerful and precious and of course, we find that true love, of course, has its source in God and how he is God is love. We know that. And, and through God, we see that love is both powerful and love is precious. His love is powerful and precious. Can you say it with me out loud? Love is powerful. Love is precious. Love is powerful. Love is precious. Yes, it is. And we can see in this account, that's the case. See, in this, this morning, we're going to look at these two aspects of love that is powerful and precious. And, and from that, we can see from Jesus' encounter with this woman, who is probably Mary, who anointed him, anointed him with perfume, we're going to discover two more, two more specific details about those two aspects of love. We're going to be looking at God's love for us, but just how powerful love is because of it. And our whole, whole, whole purpose then, I think, is that one, we hope we can see how much he loves us in a deeper way, but also how we can maybe ha let him love other people through us. That's our goal. So let's take, let's look at the first part now, the description, the description about Jesus' love, God's love, is how love is powerful. When you encounter express true love and you break it down or analyze it, you have to realize that love really is powerful. If you think about it, in our passage today, we learn two key ways that love is powerful. And one key aspect of love being powerful is that love has staying power. Jesus stayed for us. Uh, hopefully you received in your uh, bulletin, you'll see a, a fill in the blank uh, thing. And, and I hope you can fill that out right now. Uh, we're talking about love having the two mean aspects of powerful and precious. And then when we look at powerful, it has two different ways it's, we can see it's powerful. And one is that love has staying power. Look with me at Matthew 26, verses 1 and 2. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, Passover begins in two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Uh, folks, this is just absolutely incredible. I, I was just thinking about this. And just thinking about this. You see, you, may, you could read this passage over and over again and miss it. You can read right through it and miss a powerful aspect of love here. And that is that love has staying power. And look at here at Jesus for a moment. He's, he is saying, what he's saying and doing here describes staying power. Jesus is predicting his crucifixion. It's going to take place in just a couple of days. We already know that he's already been pre uh, predicting about this. In Mark chapter 10, we learn that he was resolute, heading to Jerusalem, getting ready to be, he talked about he's going to be crucified, he's going to be handed over by uh, sinful men, he's going to be flogged, he's sped on, and he's going to be crucified. He talked about that, and now he told that to disciples, and now he's walking hard right to Jerusalem, and his disciples are like, I can't believe this, and they're like not wanting to follow him, because they know where he's going, and they don't know what that might mean for them. 
And Jesus right now, just a couple days in advance of his, of his arrest and his crucifixion, is saying this matter of factly, impassively. He's saying this in a manner like, oh yeah, by the way guys, in a, in a, couple, in a couple days I'm going to be spat on. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be crucified. When you read that, you don't even sense emotion through it. Like, uh, uh, next thing on the list, oh yeah, to the list, oh yeah, be crucified. What am I trying to say here? If you knew you were going to be dead and you have to go through crucifixion in two days, would you stay there? Think about it. You, let's say you're Jesus right now. You know you're going to have to be whipped like crazy, tortured like crazy, spit on like crazy. You know you're going to be crucified and killed. You're going to be all that in two days. Would you stay there? Would you be freaking out? Yes. Right? But Jesus wasn't. That's powerful. Amen? That is staying power. Whoa! Think how much inner strength he had to do that. That staying power. The st and what motivated it? It was love. Love is powerful. It has staying power. It does. It's, it's, it's willing to sacrifice itself for the sake of others, of course. If it was me, I would have ran and hide or something. But Jesus' love for us is powerful. It has staying power. Reminds me what, uh, how Jesus described himself toward us as our good shepherd in John chapter 10. He compared himself with the other Jewish leaders and he regarded them as hirelings. He said this in John chapter 10, verses 11 to 15. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and, if he isn't, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have Staying power. Look at what Jesus is saying here. True, great, good sh the true good shepherd lays down his life out of love for us. Fake leaders and teachers or others who say they love us but don't truly love us. They abandon us when we need them the most. But this is what you need to see, and I want you to own this one. But Jesus doesn't abandon you. He lays down his life for us, for you. He has staying power. Amen? Wow. Because he loves you. True love is powerful. Because love is staying power. It doesn't abandon the one it loves when, it, when the going gets tough. Love is powerful. It has staying power. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful. Endures through every circumstance. Love, it, love has staying power. It doesn't abandon. It doesn't give up. Isn't it neat to think that God has staying power for you and for me? He doesn't abandon you. He doesn't abandon me or give up on us. He stays and he faces the consequences, even if the consequences are not of his doing and means pretty bad stuff for him. That is deep stuff. Amen? Now think about this. Each of us right now should be thinking about Jesus has staying power for me. Can you say that out loud with me, please? Jesus has staying power for me. Yes, he does. He's already proven it. And he continues to do that. It's amazing to think what he does for us. Jesus went to the cross for your sin and my sin, not his own sin. Isaiah talked about that. That prophecy about Jesus that Isaiah wrote 700 years before Christ's birth in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. 
But he, a prophecy about Jesus, was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. This was prophesied over 700 years before it happened and he, Jesus did it. He has staying power. He lays down his life for his sheep. Folks, we got to, here's a key point here. We got to get it past here and we got to get it in here. Are you with me? We got to get it past here and we need to get it in here. He has G, his love for us has staying power. He doesn't abandon us. We need to own that reality. And we need to follow his example and exercise that staying power toward other people. Amen. Uh-oh. Amen. Okay. I didn't, you didn't want to say amen to that one, did you? Because love has staying power. It's not easy, but it's... We needed Jesus to be that way with us, and others need us to be that way with them too. Okay, love is powerful. Love is precious. It's powerful by having staying power, but it's also powerful because it defends us. Love has defending power as well. He defends us. Look with me at Matthew chapter 26, verses 7 to 11. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It, it could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, replied, Why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. Jesus came to the defense to rescue this woman from the criticism of his own disciples. She poured expensive perfume on Christ's head. Love defends the person it loves. The disciples didn't care about the woman. Their indignation indicated misplaced priorities. Hey, yeah, of course it's good to take care of the poor. Absolutely. But Jesus is king. He's Messiah. And he deserves our best. And love defends the person it loves. And love is extravagant. There's actually more to this incident than you might realize at first. Matthew doesn't talk about it, but John kind of elaborates a little bit more on this situation. It tells us that Judas was the keeper of the money and that he was the main culprit here. He wasn't concerned about the poor, John went on to say. All he was about was the money. He was the keeper of that money, and he often stole from the treasury that he kept himself. Look with me at John chapter 12, verses 4 to 8. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Isn't it nice to know God gives us four different accounts in the scriptures about Jesus' life and ministry? Isn't that fun? So they, and they, are, they don't con contradict each other. They just help fill in some holes different here. Gives us, gives us better understanding and elaboration. It's really cool. So John's explaining about the situation about Judas. See, Judas wasn't about the woman at all. He was about greed. In fact, we know it was because of greed that he ultimately, right after this occurrence account, we read it later on in verses 15 and 16 of Matthew 26, that he actually went to the the Jewish leaders and asked for bribery money to betray Jesus. He was about the money. And maybe also a little bit resentful because Christ held him accountable there. So maybe greed and being defensive led him to do that. But regardless, we know that Christ came and defended the woman who did a generous, selfless act. And love is powerful. It has defending power. 
Jesus wasn't afraid to speak up to the woman, and he wasn't afraid to have a minority opinion at, at that time. Most, maybe most of the disciples were on Judas' side. Didn't matter. Jesus was about right, and he was about love. And he was about the love of that woman right there, Mary. He was about when love is being expressed, and he defends what's right. Love is love. It's always worth defending. And Jesus defends you too. Even when you don't know Jesus defends you, he's your defender. That's why he went to the cross to defend you before the Father. In Zechariah chapter 3, the Bible talks about how Satan accuses us before the Father day and night. He was the accuser of Joshua the high priest at that time. And we also know though in 1 John that for, while he, Satan's trying to accuse us all the time, Jesus is our defending, the defender. He's our defense attorney. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it talks about how he's our, our, uh, the one who defends us. Our, he's the one that comes to our side. He comes to our aid. He, because of his death and ultimate resurrection, we could be declared not guilty before God. It wasn't because we deserve to be declared not guilty, because we are guilty. People say, I would go to heaven, I can go to heaven, I'm a good person. Wrong. Every single person is not good. We've all messed up. Amen? Only Jesus hasn't messed up. And he was the one that didn't need to, did not need to go to the cross, but he's the one that did for us because he's our defender. It's his love. He has staying power. And he's a defender. He has defending power. He defended you and me. Still does. That's why we can go before the Father. He has defending power for you and me. He still, it wasn't, oh please, don't think, think about this. And Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. Do you think then God, because he was willing to give up his own son, won't he also therefore give you all things, God said through the apostle Paul. In other words, if, he's, if God is willing to sacrifice his own son for you, don't you think he'll defend you on anything else as well? The answer is absolutely. There is nothing he's not willing to do for you. That's the whole point. He's already laid the cards on the table and all of them says love for you. That's what it says. But we have to believe it. Love is powerful. It has staying power. It has defending power. But love is also precious. And there's two descriptions of how love is precious. One, love is lavish and unbridled. It's, un, it's lavish and unbridled. Matthew chapter 26, verses 7 to 9. While it was eaten, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. And Mary poured out a very expensive perfume here. It was a lavish, lavish gift. And this lavish gift was sprung out of lavish love. R.T. France, the commentator for Tyndale, for Matthew, said this. He described the quality and exclusiveness of this perfume. He says, the very expensive ointment is identified by Mark and John as nard or spike nard. An extremely expensive luxury imported from India. Used especially for anointing the dead, which is interesting there because Jesus said, she's preparing my body for burial. Isn't that interesting? In John chapter 12, Judas had stated that it was worth, that that amount of perfume was worth 100 days wages. Picture the average, I don't know, wage for a day. Who knows? You can say anything. We'll just we'll see, pick a number. We'll say 150. A person makes 150 a day. Let's say that. Now multiply that 150 times 100. What does that come up to be? $15,000. Get an idea of what today's amount that perfume was, was worth. It was not a minor gift. And Mary, there's no indicator that she and Martha and Lazarus were rich. In fact, no indicator at all. But she did something that was out of her pocket that she couldn't afford because of her love. And from this, we can learn that love isn't always reasonable. It's not always cost-effective. It can be, maybe, but it's not always. Sometimes love just pours forth from a desire or care for someone to enrich another, and it doesn't matter how the personal sacrifice or cost to itself. 
Its focus is on the welfare or blessing of the other person, not oneself. In fact, it usually refers to the loss of self. And the woman was doing that. Mary was doing that simply because of love for Jesus and greatly wanting to express her love. Her selfless deed exposed Christ's honoring love. And that's how Jesus' precious love is for us. I, I, it's, un, it's lavish. It's unbridled. Think about it. It compelled him to go to the cross. Think about it. The Bible is very clear. He, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Jesus, who, who being God, did not regard a equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to instead he emptied himself taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of human beings and then of course it said he when it became obedient even to death he was God he is God but at that time, before that he was God in all glory he had all the angels he had I mean nothing bad all good no limitations. No, and yet he willingly gave up all, I mean, so much of the glory associated with being God. So much of the privileges associated with it. For us, there's no value to him beyond us. The whole purpose was love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It was love. It was love for you and it was love for me. Because love is precious. It's unbridled. It's lavish. You know, think about that for you and how it's powerful, it's precious, it's dang power, it's defending power, it's lavish. He doesn't hold back for you at all. That's the point. If he doesn't seem like, well, why doesn't he answer this prayer? How do you know he hasn't? How do you know the answer isn't already coming? How do you know the issue maybe is the issue of timing? And if he says no, it's because it's better for you because he knows it's better for you. He's always on your side. Folks, we keep messing up because we keep looking from our brain instead of just by faith. The Bible is clear that love is powerful, it's precious, it's unbridled. Another aspect of the last one we'll, we'll talk about, about love being precious, it identifies and honors love. Matthew 16, 13, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. When the other, the Judas and the other disciples are counting the cost of the perfume, supposedly under the guise of caring for the poor, Jesus is looking into that woman's heart. He saw honor, he saw love, and love identifies when it's being honored and loved and it loves back. And so, and it honors back. And that's what he did. He just, he just declared something. He said that whenever that scripture, the, when the good news is going to be preached now, she's going to be remembered. And she is, right? We're talking about her right now. That's how Jesus is with us, with you and for me. Every time he remembers it, folks. He never ignores or misses your expressions of love when you give it to him. Matthew chapter 6, verse 4 says, Give your gifts in private, Jesus said, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. He, miss, he doesn't miss a thing. He's seen everything. He's, done, he's seen everything you've done for him in secret and love, and he cherishes it. He's known every selfless sacrifice that you do out of love for him and other people. When it seems no one else has noticed, or even maybe God hasn't noticed, or you wonder if he cares. He does. He cares. And he continues, and he could care for this day, to this day. And he says he's going to reward you. So either he's going to reward you now, or he's going to reward you later, or he's going to reward, reward you both ways, and often, often it's both. Because he cares. He honors the one that honors him. He shows his love. And then we are the ones greatly blessed. In the 17th century, Oliver Cromwell sentenced a soldier to be shot for his crimes. He would, Oliver Cromwell would become the leader of, one of the armies eventually the leader of Britain. And this soldier had done something wrong and the execution was to take place at the ringing of the evening curfew bell. But the bell did not sound. 
They waited for it to, do, to execute the man, but the bell never sounded. The soldier's fiance had climbed up into the belfry, and she, and she had clung to the great clapper of the bell to prevent it from striking against the side of the bell. So they never heard the sound. When it was found out that she had done this, she was summoned before Cromwell to give an account for her actions, and she wept, and she showed him her bruised and bleeding hands that were just mangled. And Cromwell's heart was just touched. And he said, Your lover shall live because of your sacrifice. The curfew bell shall not ring tonight. And of course, Jesus gave his life because of, as a sacrifice for you and me out of love. Powerful and precious. He didn't have to. He has staying power. He has defending power. His love is lavish, unbridled. And it honors and loves the one that loves him. And now we're to be the same way. Love doesn't make sense, folks. And that's one of the beauties of love. It doesn't always make sense. It's selfless. We're about ourselves. We're about what's best for us. Love thinks how I can give myself for others. What sacrifice can I make? It defies understanding. But it's because of it. That's what makes it powerful and precious. That's how we're to be. That's how God is for us. Let's pray. Father God, you're such an awesome God. And Lord, when we talk about how powerful and precious your love is, we go, whoa. I really fall short in so many ways. Lord, forgive me for questioning your powerful, precious love for me. I've doubted it. I've feared. I've wondered if you've forgotten me. Lord, I'm just praying maybe on behalf of others. So I've had thoughts like that at times, and maybe others here have thought the same thing. Lord, help us choose to believe the truth of your word, your love for us, how powerful and precious it is. And friends, if we're praying right now, if you're one that said, you know what? I just haven't given God the glory or the praise for his love for me like I should. If that's you, you know, you just say this. Right in your own heart, could you do this? You say, you know what, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me because I have not really appreciated or understood how great your love is for me. I know what it says in the Bible, but I haven't appreciated it enough in my heart. Forgive me for that. Your love is powerful. It's amazing. It's precious. It's beyond understanding. And Lord, I want to receive it. I want to thank you. I want to believe it. I want to choose to believe it always. And Father God, I, I want you, I, I need you to love others through me like that. Because Lord God, I don't do that like I should. But I... And it kind of, in fact, it's kind of scary, actually, to be that unbridled and selfless. But I need it. I want to live that way. Lord, do that through me, please. My friends, if you can just say that in your own heart to God, if, it's, if that fits you, if that rings true for you, just tell Him that surrender again. Thank him again right now in the name of Jesus. Thank him for that selfless powerful precious love for you. Tell him thank you Lord Jesus. Thank you for having the staying power for me. For having the defending power for me. For your love being so precious and unbridled and lavish. And that you honor me when I love you. That's, cra that's crazy but thank you for that. And then, Lord, I want to love others the same way. Help me to have that. Get self out of the picture to follow you. 
Lord, I pray that for all of us. I ask that, Lord, for every one of us. I ask that for people online right now, Lord God. I ask that, Lord God, Lord, for all your church, Lord, that we would be like Jesus, that we would choose to believe your great love, how it really is, and we would just receive it and be always thankful and always grateful for it. And Lord, that we would get in line and let you love others through us, Lord God, like you love us. Lord, we thank you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.